92% of the genes that are going to have an effect on you aren't yours or mine, they're actually our microbiome. You've got to get your body out of its complacency. You've got to trigger those defenses, those longevity genes. Right now, you're about to hear from 10 of the world's leading experts in longevity, in domains ranging from fitness to nutrition to cognitive performance and more. So let's hear from our first expert right now. Yeah, interestingly enough, um, 11 years ago, I wrote uh, my first book called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. And, it was, and the subtitle was Turn Off the Genes That Are Killing You. And back in those days, we didn't know really anything about the microbiome, the bugs that live in us and on us. And I thought that it was actually our human genes that were controlling our fate. Fast forward for this book, and the reason that book was called Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution is because my thoughts have evolved. And quite frankly, if you're spouting the same thing you said 10 years ago, I probably don't want to listen to you. Right. Because it's probably broken. It, yeah, it's guess what? Uh, time marches on and research marches on. So the fascinating thing is that our genes really have very little to do with what's going to happen to us. Huge NIH study recently published that you're aware of showed that of everything that's going to happen to us in longevity in diseases, our genes have only about 8% effect on what's going to happen to you or me. So that means 92% of the genes that are going to have an effect on you aren't yours or mine. They're actually our microbiome. So we have trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of bacteria, viruses, worms, protozoa in us and on us. And even though they have fewer genes per little bacteria than you and me, because there's so many of them, the microbiome actually has well over 260 times more genetic material than you and me. Mm. And what's really cool, I, I learned this from a professor of microbiology in Paris a few years ago, and he thought and I actually subscribe to his theory that because what this huge resource of, if you will, computing power of genetic material that lives in our microbiome that reproduces constantly, he believed, and I back him up, that we uploaded most of our information processing mm -hmm. just like we upload our information processing to the cloud, we uploaded or downloaded to our bacterial cloud because they've got more computing power. And it sounds kind of far out there, you know, doo 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 doo. <laughs> but I think he's right because we now know that the bacteria within us actually control our fate. And it's really hard for you know, a smart person say, oh, come on now, these yeah. little one-cell organisms are going to control me. But in fact, it's actually true because this is their home. And I like to tell people and get people to understand that we're basically a condominium for bugs. And this is their home. And they're actually living in us at at our uh, request, and if we keep their home good, they'll keep us well. Mm -hmm. Because, quite frankly, if we're doing well, they'll have a great home the rest of their lives. And we'll probably get into this, but the amazing thing is you can take people who are 105 years old, very much like Edith Murray, and who are doing well, and look at their microbiome, which has been done, and compare that to the microbiome of 30-year-olds. And the 30-year-olds who are doing well will have the same microbiome yeah. as the 105-year-olds that are doing well. And it turns out most people, when they, if they get to that age, 
uh, have to have a youthful microbiome or they're never going to get there. Mm, so fascinating. So think about your DNA like, like yarn. Uh, that's like a big string, a big lump, a big pile of yarn. You're going to wind that yarn up, right? So you wind it around something. And that's really what our chromosomes are. Our DNA is wound up into these X's and Y's that are packed inside our cells. That's really our genome packed into chromosomes. And at the very end, you can imagine if you're winding up a ball of yarn, you got to be able to get that, that yarn to, so it doesn't unravel to stick. And so you got to put a cap on it. The cap is the telomere. Uh, you know, physically, it kind of looks like the plastic tip on the end of a shoelace, kind of protects it and holds the thing to prevent it from unraveling. That protective cap on our DNA is part of our protection. Longer the telomere, longer we think we're going to live. Cellular aging. Shorter the telomere, the, sh the shorter these cells are going to live. And so one of the big areas of research right now, by the way, this research led to the Nobel Prize uh, a few years ago, is what can we actually do to lengthen our telomere? So for those people that are, you know, sort of the Ponce de Leon people looking for the fountain of youth, Everybody's looking for things that actually keep our telomeres longer. Well, the answers are from research that I write about in my book might actually be in already in our kitchens. Mm. So, for example, coffee turns out to be a beverage that actually can not just prevent our telomeres from burning down like a fuse. It actually can lengthen the telomeres as well. So that's really quite an amazing thing that coffee can actually uh, uh, do that. But actually, it's probably more dietary pattern. You know, uh, I mean, and, and people that have good dietary patterns tend to be generally healthier. They tend to exercise and sleep better and all that kind of stuff. But the Mediterranean diet is one of the best examples of a whole food, plant, primarily plant-based diet with healthy oils, um, uh, seafood, and relatively low uh, red meat and minimal processed foods. That combination tends to lengthen telomeres. And so that's really one of the amazing things. You know, I have a colleague, Dr. Dean Ornish. He and I worked together on looking at sort of um, healthy patterns of diets. And we actually found, in fact, that um, healthy diets like the Mediterranean diets not only actually lengthen telomeres, but also at the same time, again, being mother nature being very efficient, actually are also anti-androgenic that can protect you against uh, cancer. So something that's good for the goose is probably good for the gander. Yes, absolutely. This is the crux of everything, and most scientists don't talk the way I do. We've had to invent our own vocabulary and metaphors. So DNA, we all are very familiar with. Without DNA that we get from our parents, we're screwed, right? Without uh, the ability to encode proteins and run the cell, it's important. But that information is much more robust than we realize. We think of it as this very fragile chemical. It's actually not fragile. You can boil it. You can find it in fossils. You know, right. It's pretty strong. Millions so, of years. Oh. Yeah. So this is robust, and it can certainly last 80 years, our lifespan. It can probably last 1,000 years if we're good to it. So what's the other problem? So that you said that's the digital part of the, the genome or the, the information. So there's ATCG, okay? You're, people will remember from high school days if they're not biologists. It's just a digital code encoded in chemicals, four of them. Um, and instead of being as ones and zeros, it's just four letters. But there's this other type of information that's just as important for our survival, and that's the epigenome. Okay, so what's the epigenome? It's just, that's a complex word for the control systems that control the genome in the way that, uh, forgive my uh, anachronism here, but the, a DVD uh, is the digital information and the analog is, is the ability to read that. So the digital, the DVD player is analog. So it's moving around and it can move in any possible direction. Mm. What does that mean for the cell? Well, what's actually literally happening is that as we develop as embryos, we're spooling out parts of DNA in every cell, differently in every cell. So if you're a nerve cell at this part of the brain that's developing, you'll have this big loop of DNA and those genes will stay on for most of your life, if not all. But there are parts that you don't want on. You don't want a liver gene on in the brain. So it, it spools out uh, very tightly, like you would a, a hose reel. And that keeps these genes off, hopefully for 100 years or more. But what I'm proposing is that insults to the body and if our body becomes complacent and we there are, you know there are good things we can do to our bodies what we lose is that structure these loops and these these tight bundles and those fall apart we can see that in our studies and we can actually measure that and it's a clock 
It's a clock of aging. If we measure those loops and the changes to this epigenome, I can actually tell you how old you are biologically and I can predict with high accuracy when you're going to die, almost to the month. Wow, oh, that's nuts. It's scary, right? Yeah. I haven't had it done. Would, would you get your clock done? <laughs> I mean, um, and this is just a, a little sidebar here, but this brings to mind the science behind telomeres and measuring that as this biological marker. But there's more. There's much right. more to it. That's just one aspect. Yeah, and, and what's um, comforting about this theory and, and it's the mark of any decent theory, is that it should be able to explain not just one aspect, but all aspects right. of a very complex system. And aging is the ultimate compl complex system. Yeah. And we've also got a thousand years of observation that we have to explain. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't explain half of it, throw the theory out. But uh, as I've described in, in my book, the theory does actually explain everything. Um, even telomere loss. Telomeres are the ends of chromosomes that, that wear down over time. The epigenome, the proteins that package those loops and those, those bundles are also packaging the ends of the chromosomes. And the unraveling leads to an acceleration of that loss as well. Right. And, uh, and actually the factors that stabilize our epigenome, and we work on some of these, they're called sirtuins. We've worked on them for 20 years. We can activate them by being healthy they are involved in protecting the ends of chromosomes as well and bundling them tightly so they don't erode and cause aging to happen as well. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk about these sirtuins. This is really, really fascinating. So you are, is this under that umbrella of what you're calling longevity genes? Yes. Okay. And how many are there? Well, in total, the, 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 there's dozens, but they fall into three main categories that we know of. The sirtuins, there are seven of them. In and our we bodies. all have some of them. Well, you better have all of them or you're dead. There they're they're right. really important. But we have better copies than others. Some people have variants that predispose them to lung life. There's one called SIR-T6. And if you have your genome, we can have a, have a look to see if you've got the right variant to live long time. Hmm. Um, but by the way, only 20% of uh, longevity is genetic. So the good news ah. is that a lot of it's in our hands because it's epigenetic. That's what's great about this theory is that if I'm right, Genes are only a tiny part of the story. Mm -hmm. But these genes are still important because they protect the epigenome and make sure that DVD is read correctly yeah. and doesn't get scratches so you can read the symphony for longer. Mm. This is so fascinating. So you mentioned nutrients. Uh, first of all, we have a theory that uh, bears out, which is eat foods that are stressed stressed out, uh, which is a weird concept, right? But we do it naturally. We, we drink, some of us drink red wine, which is a stressed grape before we pick it. We often eat coloured foods, so spinach is a dark green food. There's blueberries, which are dark. Uh, the whiter ones are not as, as good. So why is that? Well, stressed food produces a lot of what we call xenohermetic molecules. And uh, I'll explain what that means. It's a terrible word we coined, but xeno, X-E-N-O, means from other species. Mm -hmm. And hormesis is a very important word. you got to remember the word hormesis because every day you should think about it. Hormesis is what doesn't kill us, makes us live longer. And uh, it's a term that means you've got to get your body out of its complacency. You've got to trigger those defenses, those longevity genes. So xenohermesis is uh, you don't have to only run and eat well uh, at the right times, but you can also get these molecules from the right an uh, animals and plants, but particularly plants that are stressed. Because when plants are stressed, they're making these molecules of health for their own benefit. Right. They're trying to survive. They're right. turning on their longevity genes. We forget plants have longevity genes too. Mm. So a stressed plant will make these coloured molecules to protect from UV and dehydration. When we eat them, they trigger our own body's defences and you can get the benefit. So that's nutrition, coloured foods, stressed foods. Organic is stressed, right? You don't want the perfect lettuce that's been not put any stress. Mm. Um, and we need to do more of that. We need to let our plants stress a little bit before we eat them. And then nutrition. There's a lot in nutrition. Now, there's a debate every week about what's good. What I do is in on the part three of the book, I list it out. Um, so I, I truly believe that we've got to mix it up, right? The secret is not so much what we eat, but when we eat. Um, and also what we eat should have variety. So I don't say only eat meat. I don't say only eat carbohydrate. 
Um, I eat a little bit of everything. I try to avoid big amounts of meat because there's one of these longevity pathways. Remember I said there are three main ones. One of them senses how much meat we eat and amino acids. So you need to give it time to rest and settle down. So that's important. So often I'm not eating a big steak, um, but I will eat meat if I've worked out because our body needs amino acids. Um, but that's it. Make sure that you – It actually what's more important than what you eat is when you eat. How's that for an interesting thing to say? And what we've discovered with my collaborators, um, and I, I need to give a shout-out to one of my friends at the NIH, National Institutes of Health, Rafael de Cabo, he studied 10,000 mice. And what he tried to figure out was, is there a diet that makes them live longer? And he mixed combinations of carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and was hoping to see finally what works. And he found out they all did the same thing. They all had short lifespans. But there was a, one group where he only gave them the food two hours a day instead of all throughout the day. And they lived about 20 to 30% longer. Wow. Yeah. Love it. Wow. So I, if there's one thing I could say that I've learned after reading 10,000 papers and studying this my whole life, it's eat less often. That's so good. So the reason I call my book Aging in Reverse is imagine if we didn't have all that outside noise around aging. Because when I say aging, especially to women, um, what comes up for them is they don't want to be that or they they feel dated or has been. So people want to fight, fight, fight. Like I, I need to look 20 forever. I need to look 30 forever. But that doesn't have to be the way. And I'm not saying go accept and age gracefully either. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is it doesn't have to look a certain way. Aging can yeah. look like whatever you want it to look like. Yeah, absolutely. It could be your powerful years. It could be the years that you get stronger. It could be the years where you learn more, where you become more authentic, where you have more fun. It could be all of those things. But it starts with that shift of like, okay, what am I telling myself about this? What am I deciding? What do I want? And where am I finding evidence to support things? Like if you're finding evidence all day long that, hey, 40s, 50s, 60s is bad yeah. and that's what you keep programming yourself, of course you're going to set yourself up for issues. Absolutely. But when you look for the opposite and you validate that people can be healthy, can be strong, can be vibrant, can do these things, it starts to shift your perspective on that as well. Oh, uh, so, so good, so <laughs> powerful and so real. And it's just, this is something I've been thinking a lot about as mm -hmm. well recently is that we are bombarded with messages of aging is, yes. you know, because of all the examples and also even the way we've grown up and seeing the aging of our parents, our grandparents. And there are folks who, you know, they are needing assistance in their in their 50s and 60s, you know, and maybe their you know, arthritis so bad they're in a wheelchair or a cane. And but then there's also these examples of people who are in their 70s and 80s who are running marathons totally. and competing in Spartan races, totally. and, you know, living their best life. So what are you going to decide to make your norm? Like, yeah. that's the thing. Like, what, like, I hate statistics. I hate when doctors say, well, statistically, you have an X percent chance to live or you have percent chance of this happening. Like, I yeah. hate that because you could be the 1 percent. You could be the 2 percent. Like, get rid of that and just go for, like, where's the evidence of the one that's overcome this? You know, with my leg, with that happening in my back and my leg, I instantly could have said, oh, I can't work out anymore. I'm not going to. I This is just what happens. And you know what? No one would have challenged me. I would I could have enrolled the whole world on why my leg doesn't work and I can't work out anymore and I can't do this and I'm gonna do a whole nother career. I could have that could have easily been done. But that's not that is not fully living and aging in reverse. And I you know, I interviewed a, a woman on my podcast, a Janine Shepherd, and her story really stuck with me because she is a she was an Olympic athlete. She was training for the Olympics, she was hit by a truck, hit by a truck, training for the Olympics. Imagine this. Totally paralyzed, airlifted to a hospital told she would never walk again by multiple doctors, told this. Every reason to believe that. She refused to listen to it. She found evidence of others that could retrain their brain, and she is a documented walking paraplegic now. A walking paraplegic. Wow. There's been movies about her. All because she decided and refused to let in the noise that that wasn't going to happen for her. Mm. And when I heard that story, when I interviewed her, when I met her in person, it's like, how can I stay caught up on my leg with that? Like, really, how can I stay caught up on that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. So, again, just get this message. We have to mm -hmm. tune into different stories. Yes. You know, and not get caught up on the societal norms and conditions. Because the reality is, for, you know, centuries prior mm -hmm. to this, there was a whole different experience in aging. Yeah. You know, and if people think, like, you know, oh, well, we live a lot longer now. 
that's taking it when we're talking about the average we're taking into consideration you know a lot of people dying a lot younger totally you know due to you know uh, not having access to health care and you know clean processes and this kind of things infection mm -hmm. but we actually see if we look at indigenous cultures folks who are much older yes still out kicking it dancing with the kids being a contributing part of the society and today it's just yeah. a different story and let me tell you that's a perfect example too of you look at years ago somebody somebody had to decide it was possible to live longer right yeah. that had to happen so i have a vision that 100 years from now 50 and 60 is not going to be old like yeah. that will still be young people yeah. will still be having kids then maybe that'll yeah. still be your your youth because 100 years ago it was very different the the life expectancy 150 200 years ago totally different story so this is you have to have that vision and that willingness to step out of what you've been told or what you've believed and look at there's there's another possibility and here's the thing right or wrong you might not agree with me okay but right or wrong what does it hurt to believe that like seriously like you have if you want to give in to excuses and validating and saying it's not possible and argue with me great is that make your life any better because we've just taken away any possibility. If I say, you know what, you're right, you're thyroid, you're this, your metabolism, you're right, it sucks. You're right, your hormones are shot, you're right. Mm. You're just gonna be overweight now. You're right, you're gonna be in pain forever. You're right. Like, what does that do for you? What kind of life is that? That's a life without hope. Like, so to me, validating excuses serves no purpose. It literally serves no purpose. It makes you temporarily feel better in a moment. It does not do anything to help you live a bigger life. And for me, I'm taking a stand for people to have a bigger life because validating excuses is doing a disservice to people. Mm. Yes. And fitness has been huge for me since I was 12 years old and growing up watching uh, Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior and, and Stallone and Schwarzenegger on the big screen. So I've always been a meathead. And to this day, you look at Arnold, The Rock, they talk about like that's the foundation. Uh, yeah, everyone that I know that I look up to that's successful, that's their foundation, that's their anchor. And it, you can't be your best self if you're not taking care of your body. Like it's just a fact. You know, people, LL, Dr. Dre, they're all doing it. So you get, and, and now I think when I was younger, when we were younger, people who at 45 seemed like they were old and retired yeah, and like, yeah. you know what I mean? And I think there's still people that believe that because I, yeah. I get messages sometimes like, oh, I know, I know my best days are behind me. I'm like, what? No, yeah. you're just getting started. Like, look at, look at, look at Will Smith. Look at LL. Like they're 50 plus and they're dominating. Yeah. So I, I think there's been a paradigm shift there for sure. And I don't, I don't feel old. I feel like I'm just getting started, but, but fitness is the thing that's got to be the foundation. And also... You have to be selfish. I think most of the time you should be selfless and, and focus on other people, but you have to take care of yourself first. So if I don't get my morning routine in, if I don't get my workouts done, then I can't be my best for you, for everybody that I see. Then I'm behind the eight ball, then I'm stressed out and I have anxiety. So you gotta take care of yourself. It's the best therapy, I think. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's always gotta be the foundation. And, and I, I put it like that because people complicate it too much now with Instagram yeah. in 2019. It's like, look, three to five days a week, lift some heavy stuff, do some basic exercises. You don't have to do all the crazy stuff you see on Instagram, like just basic stuff and, and just get it done. Yeah, but in those basics, and even in this very short sentence, you say something that I don't think we talk enough about. It's not just lift, but you said carry. Mm. Why Why carry? Well, I mean, that's basically the, the, the oldest form of strength training, right? It's just picking up heavy stuff and moving it to build shelter. Yeah you know, thousands of years ago. So I, I think there's still value to that is picking up. I mean, you'll have to do that in real life, right? Like you're not going to lay down in real life and, and press a bar like this, yeah. but you're all, everybody's always going to pick up suitcases, bags, kids, people, whatever, and carry stuff. Yeah. So it's like, that's the most functional thing you can do. So farmers walks, Zercher carries, whatever. You should always incorporate that in your yeah. weekly program. You know, what's crazy, man. Like it's been probably the last, um, three months. And, you know, I told you about my injury, Yeah. but I've been doing carries. Like I'll yeah. do that to warm up. Like I'll just get a, nobody else in the gym is doing this. Like yeah. I'm just walking around with the heavy kettlebell in one hand yeah. or in two hands and just walking around, walking back. They're just like, is he putting it somewhere? You know what I'm saying? But I'm just replicating something that we would do normally yeah. in life yeah. that we should be training for. So totally. And it strengthens everything from head to toe. Your ankles get yeah. stronger, your knee stability, hip stability, Obliques. low back, obliques. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's the single arm one that you're talking about. Your QL muscle, your quadratus laborum, 
is one of the muscles that people don't know about yeah. that causes a lot of uh, lower back pain. Yeah. And Stu Dr. Stuart McGill, who's like the leading spine expert on the planet, uh, he says doing those is one of the best things you can do to strengthen that and thus prevent lower back pain. Yes. Yeah. So grab a heavy dumbbell or a heavy implement, you yeah. know, a heavy kettlebell, whatever it is, and carry one. Yep. You know, just pick up, you know, a uh, hundred yards or whatever it is, yeah. just walk or walk around your gym, do that and switch hands, walk back. Uh, I think it'll be really helpful for everybody. Absolutely. That's great, man. And then also you said drag. Yeah. That's another thing we don't really think about. Right. But drag heavy things. Again, going back to building shelter or or, or killing a, a, a moose or something and dragging it. Like that's yeah. one of the oldest forms of strength training. That's what we had to do. And it just builds strength in a more functional way than just, you know, getting in a machine or just doing a, like I said, a one arm row or something like that. Yeah. Very functional. Uh, and great for, for uh, knee strength, too, and, and preventing or rehabbing knee injuries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, so good. Uh, another one of these 45 lessons from 45 years is less is more. Mm. Less is more. Why'd you put that on there? I've always been attracted to that. And I think most people, even if they don't think about it, when somebody comes in and simplifies something for you, like if you're like, oh, should I do this, this, and you have a million options, and somebody's like, dude, those are crazy. Just do this one. You're like, oh, you, you feel such a like sigh of relief. Yeah. So and some of my favorite books are The One Thing and The 80-20 Principle and Essentialism. I think less is always more. The more you can reduce, you know, that's why uh, uh, Steve Jobs and, and Mark Zuckerberg and people have, have a, a wardrobe that they wear all the time. The, the, the more you can reduce options, the, the more your anxiety and stress goes down. The more you simplify things, the better it's going to be, no matter what it is. That, that's why I said... Like with fitness, everybody goes on Instagram and like, oh, should I do this? this? It's like, just simplify it. Just do a push, pull, a squat, a hinge. It's pretty simple stuff, you know? So I'm always looking for ways that I could simplify things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things I talked about with Steve Weatherford was he's really been, I think in the last couple of years, shifting more towards uh, eccentric training, yeah. you know, like just slowing things down. And he, he feels like, he he feels that pump and the and mm. the and, and the the changes with his muscle and the soreness, but his joints don't hurt. Yeah, you know, like he's not just like hammered, totally. like he used to be, yeah. but he's still incredibly fit. Yeah, right. So it's just like, but he's and he's doing less exercises, mm -hmm. which it's very counterintuitive because we think we should do more. Like we we've only worked out for thirty minutes, like we got to do ninety minutes. Yeah, right. But the opposite is often true. Dude, I, I think it's always true, honestly. I think most people do way too much. You know, when we're, if we're talking less is more specific to weight training and strength training, that's how I went from 147 pounds to over 220. That's how I got uh, a lot of similar results with hundreds of people in my gym and online is I really like working up to one to two top end sets on stuff. So like if you're doing a leg day, maybe you work up to one heavy set of leg curls and do one heavy set of split squats, one set of squats, one set of RDLs. And where most people are doing, especially these days, they're doing rounds and they're doing four or five sets. It's like, that's a lot of junk volume. I think the main thing that really makes a difference is setting PRs. So if you can do split squats with 35s today for 10, you should be doing 11 next week. And then you should move on to 40s. Over time, if you just get stronger, and an easy way to get stronger is to do less because that way your body's not so beat up, you're going to transform. You're going to feel better. Your joints are going to be better. Yeah, yeah. Love that, man. So good, so good. We went out there every day working hard to be the very best that we could be defensively and the very best that we could be offensively. Now, for me, I always work with weights and stuff in the offseason, but being a small guy, never really understood That wasn't nutrition. very popular then. No, it wasn't. Well. No, it wasn't. You know, because they, as a shortstop, you know, you wanted, you wanted to be flexible. You didn't want to be too tight. But I wanted to be stronger. And so in 1985... And I think this is where we were going. In 1985, I had a chance to meet a guy by the name of Mackie Shillstone, who took Michael Spinks from a light heavy to a heavyweight. And it was at that point that things kind of changed for me. 1985, my greatest accomplishment in the game today has been playing with a rotator cuff, a torn rotator cuff from 1985 to 1996. And I didn't get the rotator cuff worked on until... I had, after I retired, because it was starting to affect my golf game, <laughs> talk about priorities. But um, Mackie, when I met Mackie, um, I told Mackie that what I wanted to, I wanted to prolong my career. I wanted to be able to play beyond 40. 
you know, because 40 was the number, you know, you can't play beyond 40. I'm saying, well, that ain't what I've been taught. You know, you can play as long as you want to play as, as long as you're, you keep yourself in good shape and, and stuff. I said, 40, that's nothing. So, um, we started working and we started working on protecting the area around the rotator cuff, doing all of the, the armband exercises, the internal, external, the sword in, sword out. I know all of these exercises yeah. now because Early. it's, yeah, it's, it's those little muscles around the area. And, and I don't know if people, if you've ever had a rotator cuff tear or, or strain or whatever, that little muscle does so much for everything that you do in your life. Opening the car door, turning the radio dial, you name it. And so what I had to do is I had to work from below the shoulder. But what happens when you lose one instinct, another one takes over. So I was already pretty quick and accurate, and it just enhanced that even more. But from 85 to 96, I was still able to win gold gloves, not being able to get up on top. So I say to guys, it's easy to play when you're healthy. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's easy to play when you're healthy. It's show me that guy who can go out there and still get it done when he's ailing every day. If you show me a player that goes to a coach and say, Coach, I'm 100%. I'm going to show you somebody who's not giving 100. Because if you're giving 100 every day, there's no way that you go out there and you don't have some type of ache or pain, be it your knee, your foot. Something's, something has to be aching you. So the guys that excel at it and, and, and become greats or that are out there every day, and I know that winning is much more than getting a big hit or making a great play. Winning is being able to help my team psychologically. Mm. My being there at 80%, sometimes for a team is going to be better than somebody else at 100. Mm. Yeah. Psychologically. And so I, I tell young people all the time that, you know, when you're one of the people that the team depends on, you got to show up, man. Yeah. You got to figure out a way to get it done. And just the intimidating factor sometimes when you can – when you can intimidate a team by saying that, well, I'm not going to hit it to you. When a guy would say to me, well, I ain't going to hit it to you today. I got him. <laughs> yeah. I oh, got him. Before it even starts. Before it starts. And that's the, that's the type of edge that you're looking for. If you think you're just human, then life is not so much fun. But when you know there's this mm. eternal part of us, then life becomes a very different thing. So you, you stop being influenced by so-called cultural portals. So here's a cultural portal. I'm in having my hair done and my hairdresser was 29 and her friends all say to her, what are you going to do next year? You know, like, whoa, the big three O is like that means anything. <laughs> or, uh, you know, the retirement age of 65. That was chosen by Otto von Bismarck in Germany in 1880 so that the pensioners could have a little rest before they died. At that time, the life expectancy was 18 months after age 65. It's now 24 years. Whoa. So when people associate age 65 with retirement, meaning no longer useful, then there is a tendency to internalize that and teach your biology that that means you're irrelevant. When in fact, many people are just getting started in their 60s. See, growing older, in the words of Mario Martinez, is the opportunity to increase your value and competence. That. We got a, a guy here in Portland, Maine, who runs Gateway Studio, Bob Ludwig. I don't know how many Grammys this guy has got, but he's well over 60, and he's got a golden ear, which just gets better. Wow, <laughs> that's so powerful. I spent a lot of time thinking about this, uh, this phenomenon that we all see around us. You know, as sports fans, we see all of our favorite athletes um, – just hanging around longer, you know, hanging around, having having the peaks of their careers later and later. You know, yeah. people like this is new. Absolutely, I mean, new because you hear them talking about it every time you watch sports. Now they're saying, you know, no one's ever won a, a major tennis tournament at the age of Roger Federer. No one's ever played more minutes, you know, in the NBA at this level like LeBron James. Whatever sport it is, yeah. they're talking about these people who are, you know, thirty five, thirty eight, forty. Tom Brady. 
uh, setting new records. And I said, what's going on here that all of these people can compete so many levels above what I'm trying to do and they're healthy and they're performing their best. What are they doing that I'm not doing and what actually makes a difference? So one of the most fascinating things, I wanna dive into some of these reasons why folks are able to you know, have longer careers and what we need to look at, like some of the things that's going on behind the scenes that might rob us of that. And you shared in the book that, because we tend to think it's, it's you know, because of um, loss of muscle, for example, we lo- we're losing strength as you get older, but you say it's not a loss of strength, it's a loss of power is one of the issues. So can you talk about that? Yeah, power is the uh, ability to generate force in a, in a, a short period of time. So, you know, if you think, uh, if you can, if you can lift up a uh, hundred yard, a hundred pound barbell, you know, that takes strength, but to kind of explosively throw a hundred pound barbell, uh, that would be, that would be power. That's the difference. You know, it's a, someone demonstrated it for me. Like it's the difference between, he said, he said, you know, tap your finger on your chest and now take it and pull it back and go like that. That's power. And you lose power because, uh, you know, you have these quick, quick twitch muscle fibers and right. slow twitch muscle fibers. And they, um, as you, as you age, um, your muscle fibers don't, um, don't reproduce as well. They, they, they die off basically your, your motor units. Um, but they die off at different rates. The, the quick twitch ones are, uh, don't age as well, basically. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's different possible reasons for that. But the, the result is that athletes in power sports, um, you know, that involve kind of sprinting or, you know, hitting a baseball, anything like that. Um, they they tend to have earlier career peaks than athletes in endurance sports like marathoning or distance swimming, right. uh, things like that. Right. That's so fascinating. And so one of the things we need to possibly look at is training for power, I would assume. So do we have some examples of folks who are doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, somebody that I talked to, for instance, there's a uh, John Wellborn, uh, who, who, you know, runs a company called Power Athlete. He's a um, he's a former, he was in the NFL for 10 years as a lineman. And now he's, uh, as an offensive lineman. And now he's basically like a, like a power coach guru. This is, this is his whole thing. And a lot of the, a lot of the training methods and technologies, uh, that I talked about and that I, and that I, you know, researched in the course of writing this book have to do with maintaining that, that power. I mean, in, in some ways it's, it's, the key to having the sort of physiology and and strength profile of a younger athlete. Yeah. So I want to talk about exercise, just general. You know, this is in many ways kind of considered this virtual fountain of youth. So from your experience and the things that you've learned, how important is us, just if we're talking about being able to be functional as we get older, what role does exercise play for us? Oh, it's, I mean, it's everything. Exercise is... uh... Um, I, I think it's it's increasingly being recognized as the key to uh, as the key to healthy aging. I mean, it it uh, you know everything from just kind of maintaining strength and mobility as you as you age to avoid things like um, falls. You know, once you right. once you are in your your seventies and eighties and and you know may have some osteoporosis. I mean, that's that's a uh, um, a significant cause of death for for people in that age group, but. Um, the amazing thing about exercise is it is it really does um, trigger in the body the the mechanisms that that reproduce. I mean, physiologically, exercise is youth. You know, it yeah. it it resets uh, gene expression in a way that that causes your uh, your your hormone uh, your hormone production. You know, your other blood factors to be indistinguishable from those of a, from the, those of a young person. I mean, right. they can they, yeah. when they look at uh, something called uh, you know, your fitness age. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody who is very fit in their fifties can have the exact same biomarkers and the same life expectancy as somebody a healthy person in their twenties. Right, it's crazy and amazing. And you just said it. it's just how exercise is just one of those things. I think it really makes us human. It's a part of being human. You know, your genes expect you to move, mm-hmm. and if we're neglecting that, then man, we set in place the opposite this kind of accelerating aging process. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, and this is and this is something where your genes expect you to move is a great way to put it because we are just starting to, to understand uh, like the epigenetics basically, right. like all the all the stuff that, that goes on with uh, gene expression and you know, protein, uh, protein formation in your Talk cells. Talk about gray matter as well. And, and, and gray matter and they don't even know, they don't even know why, but, uh, but basically, yeah, it turns out that that exercise, especially intense exercise, 
is uh, as, as far as preserving uh, your volume of, of gray matter in your brain, um, you know, basically the stuff that makes you human, uh, exercise is just as effective as things like doing, you know, playing chess or playing bridge or doing crossword puzzles. You know, we, yeah. we, we understand it makes intuitive sense why using your brain for advanced cognition, uh, you know, use it or lose it, why, that, why it helps you preserve that matter. But we don't totally understand why exercise has the same effect, but it does. Yeah, man. And by the way, so the gray matter, this is part of the central nervous system, uh, glial cells, uh, neuronal cell bodies, synapses, uh, the synaptic clefts, all this connection. There's so much going on with gray matter and you develop more support, um, your gray matter and, and not losing it by exercising. So please, please make this a call to action that no matter what, we're getting some movement in, not just for the physical benefits, because a lot of times we exercise because we're trying to get sexy, you know, that's, but that's kind of a side effect. It's not the main objective. The main objective is keeping our brains young and keeping our bodies, you know, like you said, those biomarkers significantly younger just by getting into movement. Stress is, you know, devastating throughout the body for a lot of reasons. And it's almost, um, if you looked at lifestyle factors and reasons that people get sick, bad diet is right here. Stress is like right below that and the inability to uh, managed stress is a is a huge component of of um, it's the the what we call the etiology of disease. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about the stress component of um, some autoimmune diseases. You can talk about the stress component uh, of type two diabetes. Uh, you can talk about the stress component of obesity in general and and metabolic syndrome. What happens under m most conditions of stress? And by the way, stress is not a generally a bad thing. I mean you build muscle as a result of stress exactly. that you incur in the gym. It's hormetic but stress. These, yeah. yeah, these are hormetic stressors, these are acute stressors that when controlled actually cause the body to respond positively. But, um, and the best example I'll give you is that um, when I was a runner, um, the occasional uh, hormetic stress was going to be contemplated to make me better at what I was doing, but doing it the same thing day in and day out, 15, right. 20 miles a day every day, ultimately destroyed me because all it did was accumulate damage. Um, it was an accumulation of stress. So when we talk about um, what happens to the body under stress, the, the biochemistry of it is that there is a signal sent from the brain to the adrenal glands to secrete hormones. Adrenaline, norepinephrine, epinephrine are the, are the common ones that we, that we think about. But cortisol is this sort of long-term um, stress response that has interesting consequences. So when you're under stress, the body secretes cortisol. cortisol um, tears down the, it tears down muscle tissue, first of all, so that the uh, amino acids in the muscle can be sent to the liver to be made into glucose, so the brain can, be, can have more glucose and the muscles can have more glucose to run, to, to run fast. Um, it basically shuts down a lot of bodily functions, so cortisol suppresses the immune system. Cortisol, from the perspective of evolution, would be, would be like, okay, why would I invest in resources that might save me in a year or two with an immune system when I might not live the next hour or two. Um, mm. uh, cortisol uh, basically shuts down uh, a lot of reproductive processes. Again, the body goes, well, why would I invest in reproduction when I might not even live the next you know, couple of hours? So uh, um, cortisol uh, decreases the uptake of calcium by bones. Again, you want to divert the calcium to to the electrical channels that are that are causing nerves to fire and hearts to beat rather than building a structure that again ha will have no use if I don't survive the next couple of hours. So cortisol has all of these um, these sort of consequences that make sense in the in terms of a short term event like I'm being chased down the plains of Africa by a saber toothed tiger. I got to survive the next two hours and if it takes me a couple of days or weeks to repair the short-term damage, to repair, to, to, you know, to, to improve the uptake of calcium by bones, to, to reset my immune system back to where it should be, then so be it. I just need to survive the short term. So that makes sense in the context of like these occasional traumatic stressors. Now, fast forward to modern times, oh my God, the bills due, the mortgage payments due, the noisy neighbors next door, the traffic on the way to work, oh boy, I was, you know, all of these things that we, that we take on as stress. My relationship isn't where it needs to be. Um, I'm worried about the kids, are they gonna, you know, we all find ways in which to 
generate this same signal in our brain that causes the same secretion of chemicals that has the same devastating effect. Except now it's not just once in a right. while. It's chronic. It's chronic. It's all the time. So one of the effects of cortisol is that it, it encourages the deposition of fat. And it also encourages what we call gluconeogenesis, the manufacturing of glucose by the liver. So if you're trying to burn off fat, and yet you've got these stress hormones that are causing you to make more sugar in your liver, and, and, um, and, and also causing you to want to retain the body fat that you already have and not take it out of storage and burn it, those two things don't jive. Yeah. They don't go together. So we need to figure out ways to reduce stress. Not having a sense of purpose in your life is associated with much poorer health outcomes uh, across multiple conditions. It's associated with much less happiness, lower income levels. So many things are associated with not having a sense of purpose in our lives. And I feel that fundamentally a life which has no meaning and purpose in it is inherently a stressful life, right? We can talk about all the other things, but actually not having a reason to get up in the morning, not actually knowing where you're going with your life, I think it's incredibly stressful. Now, I appreciate that even simply saying that can sound stressful to someone. If they're hearing that and they're going, yeah, okay, fine, but I don't like my job. I don't like where I live. Um, what can I do about that? And so why I started the book with this, because I think it is probably one of the most important things. And yes, of course, breathing, exercise, meditation, nature, all those things are important and I cover them all and I give practical tips in them. But I think the meaning and purpose piece is probably the most important. And I think it's one of the freshest. It's a new idea for people to latch onto. And so, Sean, a few years ago, I came across this Japanese concept, Ikigai. Have you come across it before? Yeah. I was on Facebook. And one of my friends posted, uh, they said that these four circles, right, these four different circles, and where they intersect in the middle is your ikigai. It's how the Japanese live. It's their, the way of living your life so you have meaning and purpose. And the four things are this. You need to find one thing in your life that you're good at, that pays you money, that you love, and that the world needs. And I thought, okay, that was great. I like that. I would like a bit of ikigai in my life, mm -hmm. right? But then I would use this concept with my patients, and I talked to them about this. And for many of them, they just found it too intimidating. They found, yeah, man, that sounds great, but how, how am I going to get there, right? And, and actually, on the UK book tour back in January, I remember I gave a big talk in London, and at the Q&A at the end, a Japanese student put her hand up, and she said, Dr. Chassi, look, I'm very familiar with Ikigai. It's part of my culture, but I found it very stressful my whole life. It's an impossible ideal for me to live up to. Do you see what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it, yeah. it's great if you can get it, but many of us don't feel we can. Yeah. And so I created a new framework in the book mm -hmm. called the Live Framework to help people start to find meaning and purpose. Um, it's like called the Live Framework, L-I-V-E, L for love, I for intention, V for vision, and E for engagement. Now, we don't necessarily need to go into the whole thing, but I think the first one is super, super interesting for people. And I think it will really shed some light onto their lives. L is for love. Right, So that is about passion. So the research tells us this, Sean. It tells us that regularly doing things that we love makes us more resilient to stress. Mm, yeah. But conversely, being chronically stressed makes it really hard for us to experience pleasure in day-to-day -day things. Mm. So it works both ways. Yeah. So passion is a huge part of meaning and purpose. It's a huge part of stress. It's a huge part of health. I had a patient maybe a year ago, 52-year-old chap, right? He was, the, um, he was the CFO of a plastics company local to me. And he came in to see me. And he was, he was married, he had two kids, he had a good job, you know, he was living in a pretty decent house. You know, from the outside, his life was good. But he came in to see me, he said, Dr. Chastity, look, um, some days I kind of struggle to get out of bed in the morning. Um, my motivation's down a little bit. I feel a bit flat about things. Is this what depression is? And so I, we were chatting. I started to try and understand what was going on in his life. I ran some tests, some bloods. They were all normal. And I said, look, how's your job? Your job's okay. I mean, I don't really enjoy it, but I've got to do it. You know, I've got a mortgage. I've got a family to feed. That's why I do my job. I said, okay, how's your marriage? 
yeah, so-so. I don't really see my wife that much. Yeah, I guess it's okay. Very, very indifferent. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, have you got any hobbies? What do you do in the week that you enjoy? He said, I don't really have any hobbies. I'm too busy. I said, what about the weekends? Weekends, you know, I've got to do all the house chores, household chores. I've got to take the kids to their sports classes. I don't have time, Doc, for hobbies. I said, okay, did you ever have a hobby? Yeah, you know, like as a kid, as a teenager, I used to love train sets. Mm. I said, okay, have you got a train set at home? Yeah, I've got one in the attic, but I haven't seen it in years. It's probably, it's probably dusty and, you know, got cobwebs on it. I said, look, what I'd love you to do when you get home tonight is get your train set out. Now, I fully appreciate it's probably not the advice he was expecting <laughs> from his doctor, <laughs> but that's the advice I gave to him. Anyway, I didn't see him for a few weeks, right? And that's not uncommon. We simply, we have so many patients, we can't follow everybody up. But three months later, I just finished my morning clinic. I, I was in the car park about to do some home visits for the like elderly patients who can't come into the practice. And I bumped into his wife. I said, hey, look, how's your husband getting on? She said, oh man, Dr. Chassi, I just want to say thank you. I feel like I've got the guy I married back again. He comes home from work. He plays on his toy set, on his train set. He's on eBay buying collector's items. <laughs> and he's subscribed to like some monthly magazine now. I thought, okay, that's great. I, I felt really good. I still hadn't seen him. Three months later, I was looking at my clinic list and his name's on it. He had done some blood tests and he was coming in to see me for the results. So I said, hey, how are you getting on compared to six months ago? He said, doc, I feel like a different person. Life is good. I've got energy. I feel motivated and I'm concentrating much better. I said, okay, great. How's your job? My job, I love it now. I'm really getting a lot out of my job. How's your relationship with your wife? So good. It's the best it's been for years. Mm. So Sean, I'm going to ask you a question. Did that chap, did that man have a mental health problem? I mean, he certainly had symptoms that would be consistent with a mental health problem. You know, yeah. I could have diagnosed him with something yeah. like depression, potentially. Yeah. But it's not what he really had, a deficiency of passion in his life. Mm. And when we corrected his passion deficiency, when he corrected his passion deficiency, not only does he feel better in himself, now that the job that he didn't like so much, he's enjoying and getting more out of, now his relationship's starting to improve. And this is why I'm so passionate about passion, yeah. right? We talk about health. We talk about the amount of vegetables we're eating. We're talking about the workouts we do or don't do. And of course, that's important. But I want people to give passion the same priority as they will give to the number of vegetables they have on their plate, right? It is so important. So the prescription I give to people is, can you give yourself a dose of pleasure every day? Even if it's just for five minutes, it could be reading a book, going for a walk, listening to a podcast, mm -hmm. right? It could be, you know, it could be coming home from work, putting on your computer, going on YouTube, finding your favorite comedian and laughing for five minutes. I don't care what it is, but that's my challenge to everybody listening to this podcast. Can you give yourself five minutes of pleasure and passion every day? And the second um, request I'd make of the audience, I know it's your audience, but if you don't mind, I, my request I'd make of them is, have a think. When was the last time you did something in your life that you really, really love? Something you did not just to post on social media, but something you did because it makes you feel good. Hmm. If it's not been for a while, that's okay. But I would suggest today at some point, you look at your calendar, you make some calls, and you schedule it into your diary. Passion is important for your health. It's as important, I would argue, as any other component of your health. Absolutely. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to up-level your health today. I just do detective work and say, okay, you know, what are these external forces, many of which are food, um, that are, or many of which are the products we've made uh, 